that I pray encourages each and one of us to stay the course. Let's read this together. Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 20 in the Message Bible, it says, God can do anything, you know. Does anybody know that? Can God, can anybody help me out here? Anything. He's God, okay? It says, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us, his spirit deeply and gently within us. Let's pray. Father, today I ask in the next few moments that you would gently, deep within us, encourage us to realize that not only can you do anything, but nothing's impossible if we remain in you. Help our minds to be aware of the promises of God, which are yes in Jesus and amen in him. We receive all that you have for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In some translations, that passage we just read puts it this way. It says that God will do above and beyond. Somebody say above. above. Say beyond. beyond. It says exceedingly abundantly. That's one translation. I like that. Not only abundantly, but exceedingly abundantly. What does that mean? It exceeds abundance. <laughs> God can do anything, and he's working in you and I. And I believe God's ultimate desire is to fill us to overflowing with every good, every wonderful, every perfect gift that he gives to us and makes available to us to fulfill our call and purpose in him. And so you and I, our purpose is really that we should live to succeed, and then we succeed to serve. Jesus said, the greatest among you is servant of all. But succeeding in life is about getting a hold of God's plan, serving others in that plan, and not letting go when obstacles come our way. Anybody ever face an obstacle in life? We just call it this way. Years ago, we used to say, there's an opportunity for improvement. How about if we put it that way? How many ever have an opportunity for improvement in life? You know, things can get better. And so I want to encourage you that with God, they will get better. Regardless of where you are in your journey, regardless of the obstacle, opportunity, challenge, wherever you're facing right now, I want to encourage you that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, far beyond anything you could ask or imagine. And each one of you is really gifted specifically and uniquely. Say this with me. Say, I, I am specific and unique. And unique. You are. Look at someone next to you say, you are specific and unique. You know that no one, no one can be you. We're in a society more than ever. We want to be everybody else, don't we? You know, we want to look like this person. We want to look like that person, that person over there, this person over there. We're so busy. Now, listen, there's nothing wrong with having a goal or maybe looking up to someone if they have the right morals and character. Come on, somebody. There's nothing wrong with fashioning our life and looking to someone to mentor, whatever. But, but the problem is we try to be like someone else. The problem is if we try to be like someone else, we'll only be, at best, second best. <laughs> because you, you're not that person. But then you leave a vacuum when you don't live to be you. Because you are gifted specifically, uniquely. And God's able to do far above in you the way he's made you to do everything that he's called you to do. Look at what it says in James 1.17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. What does that mean? God doesn't change. God is always the same. Today, yesterday, and forever. Come on. He's always the same. And so good things come from him. Say good things. Good things. For, me. For me. You got to believe that. God gifts us with good things to perfect the work that he started in us. And his gifts come to us and are made available to us through his manifold grace. 1 Peter 4.10. It says, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So my question is for each of us here this morning, am I managing the gifts and the calling of God properly? Am I stewarding them properly? Am I praying? Am I fasting? Am I seeking God? In fact, there's two opportunities to fast together this week. We say as a congregation, we fast and pray together every Wednesday. Say Wednesday. Wednesday. And every first Friday. Say first Friday. first Friday. So this week, we have two opportunities to fast and pray. If you can attend the prayer service, please attend. But at least set aside a portion of food for those two days. You can go more if you want. Fast the whole week. Whatever God puts on your heart. We have fasting helps on our website. 
But then join us for service at 7 p.m. Wednesday, 7 p.m. Friday. But am I seeking God, not just with a corporate prayer, but in my life so that I can become a good steward or manager of the gifts and the call of God? Finding out what those gifts are and then ministering to other people out of those gifts perfectly. Perfectly aligned and perfectly assigned for God's purposes. Don't put it up there yet, but in Ephesians chapter 4, read it on your own, please, uh, starting in verse 11. And Paul the Apostle says that God gave some, all right, to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, for the equipping of the saints. So that's what's called the fivefold ministry, the pulpit gifts, if you will, to teach, uh, to encourage. But then the work of the ministry is everyone's responsibility. So whose responsibility? And say, that means me. That wasn't as loud as everyone. Say, that means me. me. All right, for the equipping to find out everything God has in line for you and then be part of that. All right? To, To witness to people, to pray for people, to bring the kingdom culture of God into the workplace, into the home, into the schools. How many know we need influence in schools nowadays? I mean, and I, I'm so thankful there's so many good teachers and administration and staff in our public schools. But how many know we need help when, when they ask kids what pronoun they prefer to be known as? Like, are you a he or a she? That's asked, right, on enrollment questions. And, and, you know, if you're a parent, you may know that. At least you should know that. And I understand everyone deserves to be loved and mercy and grace And we love people, even if they're confused or influenced by the culture in a way that is not the way God would want them to be influenced. I understand that, but when we put the question out there, well, what pronoun do you prefer to be called, he or she? So we need help and we need culture in our schools. But also, God expects us to minister to one another in this manifold grace of God, many folds, many shades, many colors, multicolored, multifaceted gifts. So Ephesians 4, read in verse 16. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effect of working by each, or which every part rather, does its share, causing growth of the body for the edifying or building up of itself in love. And so when we don't become who we're created to be and the gifts and the purpose of God, do you know that the body of Christ suffers? You not becoming everything you can be to encourage other people, to be part of, by the way, men's and women's groups meet this Saturday, the first Saturday of every month, 10 a.m. The busy weeks, the beginning of the week are busy weeks. We can pray Wednesday, we can pray Friday, 7 o'clock, both of those. Men's and women's, 10 a.m. Saturday. If you can make it, service on Sunday to celebrate communion and worship Jesus together. But men's and women's groups coming and being an encouragement to other people. Be part of Wednesday services to be an encouragement to other people. To pray to, for, with other people. Be part of a, of a small group. Invest in other people's lives. Serve other people. Ask someone out to coffee or lunch. Get to know them. Be part of the body so that the body can edify itself in love. In fact, Romans 12 puts it this way, chapter 4, for as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. See, that's why it's important for us to be who we are, who we're created to be. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. We're supposed to give liberally. He who leads with diligence. What does that mean? Don't quit. Stay the course. Stay the course. Stay the course and lead. And he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So these are giftings that God gives us so that the body of Christ can edify itself in love. So the bottom line is you and I are appointed by God. Say, I am appointed. Say, I am anointed. 
And it's true. You're appointed by God, anointed by God to fulfill your purpose in God. And life is full of appointments. I don't know if you notice that. Business appointments, lunch appointments. You, go, you have a lunch appointment coming up and you're praying I don't preach too long so you can get to lunch. We, we, we have a, an appointment with our ministry team after this service. Uh, appointments with doctors, appointments with dentists. Come on. Appointments with the mechanic, all right? We, appointments with family. We have an appointment with our family this, this, this evening, so we look forward to that, all right? Life is filled with situations and opportunities that are specifically, I believe, chosen and used by God to fulfill his purposes that you and I are destined for. We have been appointed by God. And even if there's something that's happening that isn't something we really want to go through, an opportunity for improvement, as I said earlier, God doesn't bring those things into our life, but he already knew it was going to happen. Yeah. I think it would do us well when opportunity comes knocking for improvement is just say, you know, God's not surprised. Right. God's not surprised by the challenge you face, by the disappointment you've had, by the bad news that you've got. God is not surprised. He knew before the foundation of the world. God, that's the thing about God. He knows everything all the time. Let that sink in. So he's not surprised. And so even in that opportunity, we know that because God has gifted us, because he's appointed us, that we will bear fruit, even in challenging times. In fact, here's how Jesus put it, John 15. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain. Not only are we supposed to bear fruit, but our fruit is to remain. See, I'll just put it this way, one way. God is a generational God. So my question is, what are you building for the next generation? Are you allowing God to bear fruit in your life that your fruit can what? Remain, outlast you and I, that our fruit would still be here. We should have a platform for the next generation to take over where we left off, ministering to one another, becoming all I should be. In all those gifts that we looked at, whether it's teaching or leading or giving or whatever God calls us to do, to be a part of to bear fruit that will remain for the next generation. And whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Yeah. See, appointments are all through the Bible. In the Old Testament is in, in particular, you'll see that priests were appointed, singers were appointed. In fact, the singers many times were appointed to go before the army into battle. Come on, somebody. Yeah. That was another message I almost preached this morning, but Holy Spirit shifted it, eh? Whenever I have just one standalone message, I've got like three or four options. This is something my head is like this, you know. But this is the one that won. This is what I believe God wants us to hear. Singers were appointed. Kings were appointed. Lands were appointed. Governors were appointed. Uh, entire groups of people were appointed at times for specific things. And you saw that you and I are appointed by God, chose by God, chosen by God, appointed by God to do what he's called us to do. Even days are appointed by God. So when things get rough, we got to remember that we are appointed and anointed. Let's say that again. Say, I, I am appointed. Anointed. I, I am anointed. anointed. you got to believe that. You've got to believe it. And uh, there's a man in the Bible, one of my favorites to look at. His name's Jeremiah. Jeremiah. We, we find out more about Jeremiah's life than just a, really any other prophet. Uh, he writes about everything, uh, the word that God gave him. Uh, the misery that it caused him. We'll look at a little bit of that this morning. His ministry spanned five decades. Five decades. And he had a, he had a word for the Jewish people that they didn't like. They didn't accept it. How I many know they didn't like Jesus either when the word, word came of who he was? And, and Jesus kind of even used Jeremiah as some examples of how they didn't hear him and other prophets who had been sent before. But I want to read in just a moment out of Jeremiah 1 where the Lord called Jeremiah into his ministry. And I think you and I can identify with this because God will call us into things that seem way beyond us. Remember how we started out? Exceedingly, abundantly, beyond what we could think, ask, or imagine. He'll call us to do something. We'll be like, I could never do that. Good. If God's called you to do something you can't do, you're on track. I think I said it was either last week or the week before uh, if your vision in life only includes you and your family, your vision is too small. Yep. God's calling us, whether it's in uh, five-fold ministry or in business, to not only be there for, for ourselves but for other people. 
God always calls us way beyond. Rather than just having a, a one-man band business, a business maybe that employs a couple other people or 10 people or 100 or whatever, God puts on our hearts in business, but to reach out beyond what we can imagine. So God calls him, and let's read about this in Jeremiah 1.4. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Even though this is specific to Jeremiah, that's the truth for every one of us. We had baby dedications last week, and God knew us in our mother's womb, every one of us. Before you were born, I sanctified you. Does that mean set you apart? I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then said I, oh, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I'm a youth. Here come the excuses. Somebody say excuses. It's what we do. We do the same thing. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. You know, before something can be built, a lot of times, you think about it, I'm not, I'm not in construction, but I've seen enough things built over the years. Before you can build anything, you've got to clear the ground. You've got to get rid of the stones, all right, trees that are in the way. You got to clear, you got to root it out. You got to pull it out. You got to get it prepared. In anything God calls you and I to do, this is for somebody this morning. There's going to be some hard work on the front end. Matter of fact, the Bible says to do the work and make it fit in the field and then build your house. All right? It says that in Proverbs. So there's some things we're going to have to do to get on track with what God wants to build. So there's going to be some times where we're going to have to root out and to pull down. A lot of times we got to pull down our own imaginations, our own negative influences, other people's words trying to keep us back. Say, nope, I don't receive it. Just like Jeremiah, we make excuses, but God said, no, I've called you. I've placed my words in your mouth. And the blessings of God don't come without stretching us out of our comfort zone. God will stretch you out of your comfort zone. Another key, not only if God's asking you to do something, it's going to be something way beyond you, but it's also going to stretch you out of your comfort zone. You're going to have to do something. It's, I, I will never forget. And this just applies to my life, and you, you can use this however you like, but I remember when God called us to pastor and to be uh, associate pastors, worship leaders, and then ultimately, of course, he's brought us to lead this wonderful church of people here. But, but I, I still remember when God was training me in leadership, and I was reading uh, the Bible about leadership and learning how to become a leader myself and so much wisdom in Proverbs and other examples in the Bible and sitting under really good teaching. And I was reading books on leadership. Um, I mean, I, you put more trust in the, in the Word of God, but books and other people's thoughts that are Christian can really help you to become something. And, of course, I was preparing to be a leader. But I remember our kids were all really little. I remember reading a book once. And I'm reading it on leadership, and I thought to myself, I'll never be able to do this. There's no way that I'm going to be able to lead people when I'm studying on leadership. And the still small voice says, yes, you can. I appointed you. I anointed you. You can do all that I've called you to do. And here's the truth. In Philippians, it says this, that God will complete the work that he started. He will complete the work that he started in each and every one of us. And listen, we're in good company when we question God. we got to get out of that funk at some point and get on track. But, you know, everyone questions God. Moses questioned God in the call of, on his life. Gideon questioned God. Look at this, Moses. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, I'm of uncircumcised lips. How shall I or how shall Pharaoh heed me or listen to me? See, he made an excuse. Say excuses. Then, of course, there's Gideon led uh, the children of Israel in a tremendous victory. So he said to him, Oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. So not only was he the house of Manasseh, which was the last, but his clan was the last, and his family was the last, and he was the least of all those. You ever, you ever feel like that sometimes? See, that's what the devil wants you to think. I am unqualified. And yes, you are, but you're not. Okay? 
kind of an oxymoron there. You're not qualified, but you are. And, and if you don't feel qualified for the call of God on, on your life and what he's spoken to you, you're in good company. But press on. Pray fast. Feed on the word. And start to walk into the destiny that God has for you. Because the truth is, no one can, can disqualify you from the appointment that God has put on your life. He qualifies you and he will not disqualify you. And there's momentary trials that we all face in life. But really, I believe when we face trials, if we have the right attitude, we'll see that those trials, those circumstances will actually propel us into the future that God has for us. I know I've said this before, and I really believe it. The most challenging times in, in, in our lives, me and Trish and our family, have been things that were unpleasant. We didn't like it, but we can look back now and say, you know what, that was the thing that shaped us for where we are now. That was the thing that helped us become who we are to endure what God was taking us to do. And so the opportunities for improvement in our lives, we've got to say, okay, all right, God, I, I think I said it in our, our last series because I'm just all about this. How about if we change our prayer to why me to who is this for when we're facing something hard? Why? Because God, if you'll let him, will comfort you. And then the same comfort that he comforts you, you get to comfort other people. So rather than play, what, pray, why me, God? Say, who's this for? And then face it with diligence and say, okay, God, I'm going to get the most out of this opportunity improvement. So disappointment. Anybody ever face disappointment in life? All right? Disappointment. Dis means this. It means to go in the other direction. Disappointment's design is to cause you and I to go in the opposite direction of what our appointment was. That's why it comes, to get you to quit, to get us to give up on the plan of God. God appointed us, and if we respond with disappointment, disagreement, and discord, it's going to rob us from the future that God has for us, and we'll draw back and we'll never fulfill what God has called us to do. Don't you allow life to do that to you. Jeremiah's life was plagued by disappointment, plagued by disappointment. One thing after the other. He had an unpopular message. No one wanted to hear it. But he continued to speak the word. In fact, at one point, they put him in uh, stocks inside the city gate, or in the back of the city gate, rather. Put him in stocks as a public ridicule. People would walk, walk by and call him names. Embarrassment for the message that he had. Look what it says in Jeremiah 20 out in the Message Bible. Jeremiah says, you pushed me to this, God, and I let you do it. You were too much for me, and now I'm a public joke. Have you ever felt like, God, I served you, and now look what happened? You ever Come on, can you be honest? Now, don't, you don't stay there, but there's times where you're like, God, why did you do this? All right, Jeremiah felt the same way. He said, you pushed me to this. I'm a public joke. They all poke fun at me. Every time I open my mouth, I'm shouting murder or rape, and all I get for God warnings are insults and contempt. Maybe you're at a job or you're in a family situation. I don't know where your challenge is, but you've, you, you, you've spoken the word that God's given you. You've lived the life God's asked you to live. You're allowing God to build your character, and no one's listening. Does it ever feel like that? Things aren't changing. Things just seem to stay the same. Well, let me encourage you that God is working in that disappointment and giving you the skill you need to be able to achieve what he's called you to do. Don't let the devil cause you to quit. Don't let negative influences and words cause you to quit. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Roadblocks, disappointments, heartache, confusion. Has everybody, anybody ever felt confused? So you're here this morning, and I believe so many of us are probably desperate, desperate for answers, for breakthroughs, for healing, whatever it may be. Number one, we got to cry out to God. It's okay to cry out to God, okay? It's okay. He wants us to turn to him. How many know when your kids need your help, you like it when they need your help, right? Come on. You like to see them take care of them, themselves, but you like to help them too, don't you? So God likes it when we call out to him. But you and I have got to discover the promises of God are the things on the inside of us. If we've allowed them to settle there, Psalm 119, 11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. You and I have got to be in the habit of hiding the word of God, putting it inside. This is why I say you've got to read the Bible. You've got to get a hold of some scriptures that are yours that no one can take. 
Because, yeah, it's okay to say, God, why me? Why am I facing this? And then what starts to happen is that promise starts to boil up on the inside. I know in whom I'm believed, and I'm persuaded that he is going to do all that I've committed to him until that day. No matter what I face, God will do his part, and I will come out on the other end regardless. Come hell or high water, I will make it. And not only make it, but I will live an abundant life and I'll bring other people with me. Come on, somebody. I mean, that's what God wants for each and every one of us. And so Jeremiah's response, oh, why me, God? Look what happened. I served you. And look at what it's gotten me into. It starts to shift. And this is what you and I can learn. Jeremiah goes on in verse 9. He says, then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. He says, I'm done. I'm done serving you. All that gets me is I'm a public ridicule and a joke, but here's where he twists. But his word. Somebody say, but, but his, his word. word. It's kind of like, just say, but God. Okay. <laughs> but his word is in my heart like a burning fire shot up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back and I could not. The Bible says that my children will be led of the Lord. The Bible says that my children, that God is pouring out his blessing and his spirit upon my offspring. So I don't care what it looks like, they will live for God, period. So whatever you face in life, maybe you have a financial opportunity for improvement. You say, well, my God is meeting my needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Amen and amen. And then find somebody to bless. Say, well, I don't have much money. You got something. Go bless somebody and say, I can do this because my God is providing my needs according to his riches in glory. I have no lack. Maybe you get a, a report from the doctor. You say, by his stripes, I am healed. And that means go ahead and let the doctors help. And nothing wrong with doctors. They just want to help. A lot of times the medication and stuff doesn't. Right? There's really only one healer, and that's Jesus other things can help us, and maybe we, we need a little bit of help to get some things in balance. But ultimately, healing comes from the Lord. And just say, you know, by his stripes, I am not going to receive this report. That's what the report is. It's negative. I have sickness in my body, but God is my healer, and I will live and not die, and I will declare the praises of the Lord. These things I'm confessing, they're scriptures. Boom, 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 boom. What's your reservoir like? Do you have a reservoir where you can say, maybe you got to look it up and find it somehow in your concordance or, you know, Google it or something. But you know it. No one can take it from you. If someone took your Bible away, you'd say, okay, I don't, don't it doesn't matter. You know, you don't have to tear the, tell the devil, well, it's at this location, it's this verse in that chapter. It doesn't matter. You quote it. That, it doesn't matter. You, you know it's something you've lived by. It's something you've digested. It's something you've meditated on so much that you can declare, even though this thing is facing me right now, I declare that I will live and not die and declare the praises of God in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. All right? That's in Psalm 118, by the way. You go find it for yourself. Good stuff. Say, I will live. I will declare. So regardless of our circumstance, we've got to decide to hide his word in our heart. And the truth is, tribulation in our life cannot be avoided, but tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance builds character. That's what the Bible teaches us. The greater your character, the more God can pour into you. James 1, 4, he says this. Let perseverance finish its work, finish its work. So that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Do you see perseverance in tribulation and bad things happening in our life is what makes us complete and mature and ready for what God wants to give us. So anything we face, it's for our good. Again, God doesn't bring bad things into our lives to teach us a lesson. Don't get caught up in that lie. But in whatever we face, he can mature us, settle us, and we just know that it's going to work out. You know, if God is for me, come on, somebody. Who can be against me? All these things work together for my good, according to his riches and glory. Period. So God chose you. He appointed you. He never disappoints. No end is final. No failure is final. No mistake is unredeemable. No goal that God's put on your heart is unreachable. I really, really believe that. 
So whatever God has entrusted to you, your family, your career, your ministry, your business, whatever it is, don't count it as insignificant. It's something God not only planted there, but he wants to see it fulfilled. Zechariah 4.10, he says, Do not despise these small beginnings. For the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. The seven lamps represent the eyes of the Lord that search all around the world. And you know, in, in 2 Chronicles 16.9, it says that the Lord, his eyes search around the world to find someone who believes him to be faithful. And so here we see that he says, don't despise the day of beginnings or the day of small things. I still remember when God spoke to my heart that he was calling me to pastor. It started with pastoring four men. Four men. I was going through just a tremendous trial at the time. I had left a job I had been at for 15, 18 years. I don't know what it was. It was a while. I didn't get saved till I was in my 30s and so I'd been there a number of times, a number of years, gave that up to go somewhere else, and it didn't turn out the way I thought. Had my pay cut incredibly. <laughs> All of our, our health benefits taken away. And in the midst of that, God was going to do a great thing, and he says, I've got four men here I want you to reach into pastor. And I said, man, four guys. And he says, if you pastor them faithfully, you'll pastor hundreds in the years to come. I thought, okay. I'm just going to do it. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. Don't despise. You may be on course right now. You know what God's spoken. You've nurtured it with the word of God. You've prayed. You've fasted. You've faced disappointment. You know God spoke something to you, and it may look insignificant right now. It may look like it's never going to happen, but don't despise that day. Small beginnings lead to abundant endings with God. I really believe that. So hold on. Hold fast to what he's put in your heart. There's a person in the Bible I just identify with so many times. His name is Joseph. Anybody ever hear Joseph? The Bible said he was a dreamer. Do I have any dreamers here this morning? Come on, somebody, help me out. The dream from God, he had a dream. His dream was so crazy. His brothers and his father, he said, you're going to bow down and worship me. His brothers are like, we hate you. <laughs> his father's like, I hate you, but I know it's God. My paraphrase. But it was huge. He said, you're all going to bow and worship me. And you know, his brothers, they sold him into slavery, if you know the story. He said, we're sick of your talking about the call of God and the dream of God. We're going to get rid of you once and for all. Some of his brothers wanted to kill him, and finally they decided, no, we'll just sell him. And they sell him. He ends up, if you know the story, in Potiphar's house, serving Potiphar, a government official, if you will, in Egypt, and as he was doing that, his wife came on to Joseph, tried to get him to sleep with her. Joseph said, no, nope, and he ran. And as he ran, she grabbed his garment, and the Bible says she screamed. Ah! That's how she screamed right there. Ah! And the Bible says that she accused him of trying to rape her, but she was the one trying to sleep with him. And so he was cast into prison, didn't commit a crime, the Bible tells us in Psalm 105 that until the prophetic word, the dream of Joseph came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. I ask you again this morning, what's in your reservoir? When you're going through a challenging time, are you allowing the word of God to test you, to build your character so that you can be complete, mature, lacking nothing? Anybody with me? And so Joseph, he didn't let go of that dream. And he ministered to those who were in the prison with him. He had a gift of interpreting dreams, and he used it. And eventually God pulled him out of that place, put him in a position, ultimately where he was second in all of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh, just kept getting promoted, interpreting dreams for people. So he served Pharaoh. And because of that, ultimately, God brought his family to Egypt and brought them back together. They worshipped him because they didn't know who he was, if you know the story. They just knew that he was, he was in charge of all the grain and everything they needed during a time of famine. And they came and they worshipped and they pleaded for food. And ultimately, God brought them all back together. 
So the enemy wants your dream to be killed with all sorts of realities. Well, I'm in a, <laughs> I'm in a dungeon now. This will never happen. You know God spoke something to you, but how many know things didn't go the way you thought they would? And now the enemy says, see, told you, you'll never make it. You'll always be a failure. But you and I need to believe like Joseph. At the end of that story, would you put that up there? I love this, Genesis 50, verse 20. It's not in your notes, but I like it, so we're going to put it up there anyway. And you'll see it as you exit this parking lot. Amen. But as for you, you meant evil against me. Somebody say, but God. but God. But God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Do you know whatever you're going through in life? Listen, God's desire is to work that out for your good so that many people can be saved. So that many people can be witness to of the goodness of God. But all along the way, you have got to control your tongue. You've got to speak God's word. You've got to embrace it. You've got to eat it and gobble it and digest it and speak it out in your circumstance. Oh, it's okay to cry out like Jeremiah and say, oh, God, why am I here? But that word has got to turn around, and you have got to start to confess it over your situation. Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. You can produce life or death. Speak life that you may live. Proverbs 15, it says, kind words heal and help, cutting words wound and maim. So let me ask you this morning, what do your words say about you? Are you agreeing with God or are you agreeing with the enemy? Like I say, it's okay to have a thought. It's okay to have a little bit of a, a breakdown, if you will. But God expects us to speak life into our future by his words by the things he places in our hearts. 2 Corinthians 4.13, it says, since we have the same spirit of faith, we speak. Faith has words. Faith has a sound. Galatians 3.5, therefore he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? The hearing of faith. Faith has a sound. Faith speaks. Jesus said, say Unto this mountain be removed. Come on, somebody. Whatever things you desire, say it and you'll have it. Faith needs to be heard. Amen and amen. Put God in charge of your work. And what you planned will take place. God spoke, let there be light. Noah preached deliverance and received it. Remember Moses decreed the plagues, and led the children of Israel out. Remember, he was the one that said, I can't speak. God used him anyway in a great, miraculous way. Joshua commanded the sun and the moon to stand still, and you know what? It did. Faith has a voice. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego confessed the word of God, Daniel 3, 17. They trusted God. Finally, I want to leave you with this. This is what Jesus declared about himself, Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed. Let's pause. Say, I, I am, am appointed. appointed. I, I am, am anointed. anointed. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recover his sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus spoke his future into existence. John the Baptist was the same way. He says, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. He knew he wasn't the Messiah, but he knew his, his job. He knew his function. He knew his call. He knew his purpose, and he spoke it into being. With every head bowed and every eye closed in this place this morning, I want to pray. Father, I pray that you would help us in our disappointments, our distractions. Our opportunities for, in, uh, for um, uh, opportunity for improvement. There you go. God still hears your prayers even if you stumble. But I ask, Lord God, that you would help us to stay focused and fixed on the word of God. That that thing that we knew you promised will come to pass. As we're waiting for that promise, we will speak life and not death. And we will see that the author and the finisher of our faith will complete all that we've committed to him until that day. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad you stopped by the website today. 
We pray the teaching you just listened to impacts you in a way that helps you on your spiritual journey. Please take time to check out the rest of the website. It is full of information about our church, as well as resources to help you in your walk with Christ. If you have not already attended one of our worship services, we hope you make time to visit us in the near future. Everything we do here is designed with you in mind. The Bible says your real life is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All of our activities point to one thing, our mission statement. Real people living real life with a real God who has the answer.